the Dave is in the queue. Yeah. We're live. Yes. We're live. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I'm getting some feedback. I'm not sure if anybody else is. So we'd like to call the Victoria County Council meeting for Monday, May 17th to order. Uh, the agenda has been circulated to you. And are there any additions or deletions to the agenda for tonight's meeting? Hearing none, can we have a motion to approve the agenda as circulated, please? So moved. Moved by Councillor McLeod, seconded by? Second. Councillor Organ, thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary minded, motion's carried and the agenda has been approved. So our first item on the agenda tonight, we have Dave Parkinson, he is the chair of the uh, Decision Recruitment Committee for Southern Victoria County. And uh, he's going to provide a brief update on their activity. And uh, on behalf of Council Dave, we'd like to welcome you to Council. And uh, we're going to let you go through your presentation. And if there's any questions, comments, uh, we will open them uh, that up at the end of your presentation. So please proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to be here to give you an update on how things have gone since uh, last, uh, I guess it was last fall when, no, it's probably the fall before that, wasn't it? Lost track of time with uh, with COVID. So um, since, since council uh, held the meeting at the courthouse and we sort of got the community together, we came up with uh, some groups it took us quite a while to really understand how the process worked and really try to get our head uh, wrapped around what it is uh, that we had to do and what the role was. Uh, it is, um, you referred to us as physician recruitment. I would almost suggest that our role is more that of a, a retention and welcoming committee. A lot of the recruitment activities uh, have to happen through NSHA and through the hospital itself. Uh, but what's really important for uh, the community to be able to do through this organization and, and as supported by the county is to be able to welcome the potential physicians to the area, uh, make them feel like this is the place where they want to, uh, to move to, um, and sort of, you know, if they, if and when they get here, uh, put some effort into trying to make sure that they want to come back. Uh, so we have actually had a fair bit of success um, and you know that was started by the county kind of getting us galvanized. It was then started and followed up with the financial support that we needed to kind of um, you know keep things moving and and uh, take some physicians out to dinners and, and do things like that in order to you know make them feel like uh, this was a you know a home for them to come to. So we had, uh, 2.5 uh, physician positions that are available to uh, this area from NSHA. And currently we have been able to fill, um, we, the global we, NSHA, the physicians and ourselves, we've got two of those positions filled. We have uh, a young doctor starting here, uh, probably in the fall, her start date is a little bit unclear. Uh, but she's moving here on the 13th of uh, July. She then has to spend some time getting things uh, organized on the paperwork side of it with the plan that she will probably start in early September. Uh, her name is Erica Di Clemente. She's coming up from, uh, from New Jersey where she uh, was working in an ER at um, a Jersey Shores facility. And she is really looking forward to starting here. She, I was communicating with her the other day. Uh, we have some move related uh, tasks that we're trying to resolve. And she said she was looking forward to starting this new next chapter in her life. So it's all very positive. Uh, we also, and so she's signed a five year return of service contract uh, with NSHA. So our job over the next number of years will be to take a new person to the community and, and let them know what the community has to offer, you know, put some time into making sure that they appreciate what the community has to offer in the winter when maybe you drive around and you say, geez, not much going on around here. Um, 
So that's our ongoing role. Now that she's here, we have to work towards integrating her into the community, uh, getting her connected with, as a young woman, other young women in the community. She's very sports minded. So Rachel Germani is going to be involved with, uh, you know, with trying to, you know, keep her motivated and involved and, and uh, aware of the different things that are happening. We have another uh, five-year return of service contract that has been signed with a gentleman by the name of Colin Bonner. Now, this is a ways out. He is still um, uh, two and a half years out, out uh, from coming here, uh, but I've already communicated with him and he's already looking to purchase uh, real estate. Uh, he and his uh, fiance or wife, I'm not 100% sure, are both from Industrial Cape Breton and they're looking to relocate in this area. She currently works uh, down in Sydney. So that's another uh, good news story. Again, as, as time develops and we have a role to play as the kind of retention and welcoming committee, we will do that. My job in the interim is to keep contact and make sure that there aren't any headaches that they're being presented with that they can't solve. We have another gentleman, he's coming, uh, around, I think, June 17th. His name is Ed Pilon. He's an ER, ER doctor from uh, St. Joe's in Toronto. Um, he was on a bit of a recruitment uh, path uh, last fall. Uh, we invited him up here to Bedeck. Uh, we took him out to supper, uh, took him on a tour of the village. He's decided that he wants to come back and see what the village is like in, in the summer. So he's coming here in uh, June with the intention of staying here until almost the end of September uh, and doing some shifts both at the hospital uh, as well as possibly in uh, Wagmacook. Uh, he might, he has reached out to Chris Milburn to see whether there's some shifts that he can do there as well because there's not a full-time, you know, ER role here that needs to be filled and technically there's only a half position left. But He's expressed uh, a lot of interest in getting out of Toronto because it's a very intense environment to be in as a physician, especially now. Um, both him and his uh, wife are from small communities uh, and they want to retire to a smaller community. He's 56, he figures he has about another five to 10 years. So maybe that's you know just the amount of time to help the newer physicians that are coming online get integrated with a little bit of support from someone senior. So again, Part of a welcoming recruitment exercise will be underway in, in the months to come with, uh, with both Erica and Ed. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else you wanna add or we'll be uh, open just, it up for some questions? Uh, just like the, the county has been, I think the, the key role that the county played was really getting this process started because I think up until then, most of us didn't really um, we didn't really get that there was a doctor problem. We knew that there was a problem, but we didn't get what that meant. Uh, there's now a fairly large number of us that really do have a clear understanding of, of the ins and outs of the process. Um, we're by no means uh, experts at it, but we at least understand that there is a role for us to play. And, and we're glad that, you know, the county got us galvanized so that we could we could do that because there's actually quite a few people who are quite interested in, in getting on top of this. And we've had a good crew that's worked really hard on the retention welcoming side of it. Uh, of course, the financial assistance was key as well because we started out with not only no idea, but we also didn't have any resources to you know welcome people and take them out for suppers and, and get them little gifts and do things like that. So um, it's been great and we appreciate it. We will continue to update you uh, as there are, you know, news events to update you with so that you're aware of what's happening. Thank you very much. And uh, Dave, if you don't mind, uh, we'll perhaps open it up for uh, any questions or comments our, our councillors may have. And uh, perhaps uh, we'll start with uh, Council McNeil in District Number 1. And just with that, uh, Dave is somewhat familiar with Council because he's uh, came to council different times with the cabot trail relay so he is familiar to a number of our councillors but some of our newer councillors if you would just indicate uh, what district you represent as well so we'll start with uh, paul please 
Thank you, Warden, and thank you, Dave. Um, it's Paul McNeil from District One uh, over Iona, all the ways to through uh, McCook right to the Red Burn. Uh, oh, I just want to thank you, uh, just a comment. Thank you and your team for all the hard work you've done over the past few years. And uh, yeah, actually, it's it's looking like it's a successful endeavor. So thanks for all sure. your hard work. Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. Knock on wood. It's a big team of people for sure that helps out. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councilor McNeil. Councilor McLeod. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, Paula McLeod, uh, Big Bedek, Middle River, uh, Bedek Inlet. Uh, just a comment. Uh, thank you so much for your help and in this uh, project. And it's news. So I'm very happy to hear all this. Um, and we're here for any anything you need, uh, the, the committee. And uh, I, I say thank you for the community to step, uh, stand mm -hmm. up and, and help us to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Councillor and Councillor Long. Uh, hi, I'm with District 4, and that goes from the deck, uh, well, from the Bell Museum north to the foot of Smoky, um, South Haven, English Town, New Harris, New Camelton. Um, and uh, thank you for your presentation. It's a great, uh, happy story that there's new doctors coming here and that they have a, a great committee to welcome them. And um, so good job. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson, District 5, please. Well, thank you, Warden. Uh, I represent uh, the Bullardry area, Dave, and uh, congratulations to you and your group. Uh, it looks like you've made some. Uh, Great success. It, it took a while, but I guess everything that uh, is worthwhile takes a while. Mm -hmm. uh, just a comment. Traditionally, people from Bulladry would go to uh, either North Sydney or Sydney Mines for most of their medical needs, whether doctors, hospital, and so on. Uh, but more and more over time, uh, people are going to Bedeck. And I know a number of people who do have a doctor in Bedeck now, and I'm sure they'll be. Uh, people from Bulletry looking to, uh, you know, engage the new doctors too. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a shift that's happened over the years. Uh, I guess there's some reasons for it, possibly because the, the doctor pool in, in the north side is not that great anymore. Some of them are retiring, so people are looking for new doctors. So anyway, Dave, congratulations from all of us. Um, I know you put a lot of work into it. Uh, it's interesting that uh, at least one of them, and possibly all three, I don't know, are uh, moving here for the lifestyle. Yes. So that's, I think, something that we can uh, be proud of, and it's a real draw for uh, all kinds of people. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We we're going to, Deputy Warden, we're going to head north, Dave. So. We'll talk to uh, Deputy Warden. Uh, thanks, Warden, and uh, thanks very much, Dave, for the uh, presentation. Excellent work. Uh, great to hear about the uh, doctors coming to the area, and we've been quite lucky here north also. We've had a number of doctors in the area. I uh, think maybe COVID is doing us a favor, and some of the people in some of the bigger cities mm -hmm. are looking to get to the rural areas, so yeah. that's great news in itself, and uh, it may open up a lot more professions to come to the rural areas. But uh, once again, thank you from uh, myself and the rest of the council for all your great work. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, uh, Councillor Oregon, hi. District 7. Thanks. Yeah, hi, Dave. I'm from down north, north of Smoky here. Uh, thanks for all your hard work. It's great to have good news stories uh, about doctors coming in. Uh, we have a beautiful county here, and mm -hmm. I hope they enjoy it and stay for a long time. Thanks again. Well, yeah, thank you. We hope so, too. That's the idea. And, and to... Uh, uh, to Larry's comment, uh, Ed and um, uh, Erica, both of whom aren't from the area, uh, it is the lifestyle choice that that has attracted them to Bedeck. Um, keep in mind, Ed's not committed; he's testing it out. Uh, but nevertheless, it is the lifestyle in Bedeck that has wanted him to give it a test drive. Thank you very much. And uh, District Number Eight, Councilor McDonald. Yes, thank you, Warden. Uh, thank you, Dave, for the presentation. They always tend to leave me to do the last because I think I'm the one that likes to do the most talking. But uh, as everyone else has said, great work. You know, it's a lot of work that's involved. I know I sit on the hospital foundation down here in Buchanan, and there's quite a bit of work that goes into recruitment and retention and just the overall aspect of gaining doctors come to the area. So, as council said, great work, and thank you for everything you folks have done so far. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Yep. Thank, you. Nope. Thank you to council as well. It's a group effort. Thank you, Thank you Councilor McDonald and uh, CAO. Do you have any questions or comments for Mr. Perkins? No, I think everyone summed it up. Uh, Dave, you're doing a great job and uh, we want to hear about more of them also. So that's great. Thanks. Okay. Very good. Yep. Thank you, Dave. And I, I just wanted on behalf of council and, and certainly on behalf of the community, particularly South uh, Victoria County, we want to acknowledge the work you and your committee have done in, uh, in recruiting physicians. Um, as you mentioned, a year and a half ago, we heard from the doctors at the hospital here. We heard from the medical staff and we heard from the community that we were almost in a crisis situation with, uh, with physicians. So clearly you guys have stepped up to the plate and done an excellent job of uh, bringing in some uh, new physicians. So uh, thank you very much for doing that and we appreciate the update and, and hopefully we'll speak again and there'll be additional moves as we move forward because we know this is an issue that is not going to go away over the next two or three years with retirements. So, Yep. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, thank you very much for your commitment. All right. To the, all right okay. Then, please Thanks. express those thoughts to your committee members as well. Yep. Will do. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. See you. We're going to move on to our next presentation uh, this evening. We're pleased to have uh, the president of Cape Breton University, the Honorable Dave Dingwall. He is going to do a presentation this evening on the uh, Center for Discovery and Innovation, which is a project that is uh, being proposed and looked at at uh, Cape Breton University. So, uh, uh, Mr. Dingwall, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to Victoria County Council. We look forward to your presentation. We're gonna turn it over to you. and We'll uh, hold our questions and comments till the end of your presentation, if that is uh, satisfactory with you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Warden and members of <coughs> Council for allowing me a uh, a time to share some information with you as it relates to the Center for Discovery and Innovation. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, congratulate uh, the previous speaker, Dave Parkinson, for his great work in terms of recruiting uh, physicians. Uh, this is just absolutely outstanding uh, and it's important for the island. The only thing I have to add to that, uh, Warden, is that uh, if Cape Breton University can be helpful in any way, particularly as it relates to the, the spouse or the partner of the physician, uh, we would be happy to, uh, to look at it in a very positive way, whether it's employment, whether it's teaching, whether it's uh, anything at all that uh, can anchor more professionals in Victoria County, <clears throat> we would be happy to participate. We just so happen to have one of the largest recruiting firms in the world uh, associated with uh, CBU. So there might be other opportunities uh, for Dave and others at CBU to uh, collaborate. Uh, but this is great success, great news. And uh, I congratulate all of those who have participated. With regards to the Center for Discovery and Innovation, this was approved unanimously by the Board of Governors uh, towards the end of 2020. Uh, the project, as you see on your screen, is in total alignment with our strategic plan, which we traveled the island in terms of developing our research plan and our academic plan. So it, uh, it is a strategic decision that we at the university have made, uh, keeping in mind our customers. Faculty members don't like to hear, hear the word customers but uh, students are customers. And uh, we believe that this particular offering, the Center for Discovery and Innovation, uh, it will uh, it'll exhilarate growth of Cape Breton Island. And uh, it adds measurably uh, to the economic wares of, of all of us in Cape Breton. Firstly, if I may, is the need. The need for the Center for Discovery and Innovation. If any of you ever come to Sydney and you drive by the campus, you'll see that uh, you have the beautiful Shannon School of Business, you have the Fisherin School. What you don't see is that in behind there are buildings which are 50 years old, laced with asbestos, and uh, quite dilapidated in terms of uh, various labs, 
uh, and the services for labs. And uh, we are in dire need of a new facility which will address that which is important to our domestic students, local students, as well as international students. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Janice Tulk, uh, references the need. Stephen, would you play that, please? Cape Breton University's science building is more than 50 years old, and we've been trying to replace it via various funding streams since 1998. We long ago outgrew the space which is home to our science and technology programs, including the popular Bachelor of Engineering Technology and Bachelor of Health Sciences Public Health. The crumbling architecture can no longer support the demands of a growing student body or the advances in research and innovation led by our faculty members and research associates. It's also the single largest energy user per square meter on campus which is a threat to sustainable operations in the future. The Center for Discovery and Innovation will replace part of the aging science building and provide new collaborative space to support campus-wide research and community engagement. Colleagues, the, the building in question is 53,000 square feet. That's the building that has asbestos in it. It's 50 plus years old. And uh, you know, you, you, you can paint the stairway, but uh, it's still pretty aged and uh, students don't like to go there. My colleague uh, in the field of engineering, uh, Melissa Dean, I think says it best, Steve. Hi, my name is Melissa Dean and I'm an instructor in the engineering department at CBU. We are all very excited about the Center for Discovery and Innovation and what it could mean for CBU and Cape Breton Island. I would just like to highlight the fact that from our perspective in one of the highest enrolled departments at the university, this project isn't just a nice to have or a potential growth builder for the campus and community. It's an absolute necessity. In recent years, we have seen our enrollment increase to the point that our aging labs and equipment are one thing, but it's the lack of available labs and equipment that is really gonna hurt our programs and opportunities for growth. In one case in 2019, a course aptly named the Management of Innovation and Technology didn't have an available computer lab for some of the lab sections. So they were done on paper in classrooms and still the students persevered. In the second year of engineering, students take a project course, which entails working in groups building and programming small robots for a competition. The project lab not being available, they had to use a classroom and send group members back and forth to the lab to get materials and use equipment when necessary. Now, we're engineers here. It's in our DNA to problem solve. So we make it work. For example, this lab that I'm in, referred to as a machines lab, as that was a classic use for it, is in the process of being retrofitted to serve as a multi-purpose lab maximizing the use of this space, which is great. However, still not enough, which leads me to stacking up necessary electrical equipment on my kitchen cart and rolling it to set it up in other available spaces. The unavailability of proper lab space leads to an inconsistency in the environment that students get to learn in. And in our opinion, that's just not fair to our students and to our future students. We are incredibly proud of our programs and we graduate highly skilled, exceptional students. They deserve better. They deserve to see us as a university, as a community, invest in their future and appreciate that they're choosing CBU and Cape Breton to help them succeed in their endeavors. The president of the student union, Armender Singh, uh, I think says it best on behalf of the students. CBU is one of the fastest growing universities, not just across Nova Scotia, but all over Canada. To meet the demand of students, it is very important we have updated and functional infrastructure to match the need. The Center for Discovery and Innovation will allow us to do that. Most of the buildings at CBU are pretty old. A lot of labs are outdated and not up to the mark as compared to what we have at other schools. This new building will be the best way to invest in our students by giving them competitive advantage when they graduate and go out into the real world. 
Cape Breton is one of the most beautiful islands in the world. However, alone the beauty can't bring students to CBU. We deserve this new building to continue to contribute to the future of our students, to continue to the development of Cape Breton Island. So that, uh, my friends, is, is the need for the Center for Discovery and Innovation. So what benefits would a new Center for Discovery and Innovation mean to Cape Breton Island? And again, my, my colleague, Dr. Janice Tulk, addresses that. Steve? One of the most exciting spaces is the learning studio, a hybrid classroom and laboratory space that emphasizes hands-on learning and collaborative problem solving. Studies of these spaces at other institutions show improved conceptual understanding, higher class attendance rates, and significantly higher success rates overall, all of which improve the persistence and completion rates of students in STEM programs. The new rapid manufacturing and robotic laboratories will modernize our engineering program and ensure that we train the next generation of engineers and technologists, not only for existing opportunities, but also opportunities we can't yet imagine. Modern technology and laboratory space is also essential for our growing nursing, public health, and emergency management programs. The importance of hands-on training in these fields can't be overstated. It's not enough for students to graduate with the competencies required for their chosen profession. They must also embody the confidence to execute those competencies even under stressful circumstances, like a pandemic. The Center for Discovery and Innovation will feature state-of-the-art research laboratories for our faculty members and research associates, as well as a community innovation hub. The open concept design, featuring multi-purpose reconfigurable space, will facilitate community collaboration, public outreach, and industry partnerships. Cape Breton University has been working with the family of Donald Marshall Jr to establish the vision for the Marshall Institute, which will focus its work around environmental justice and indigenous approaches to climate change. The Marshall Institute will honor the life and legacy of Donald Marshall Jr., both in terms of the lasting impact of his wrongful conviction and the upholding of Mi'kmaq Treaty rights. The space will focus on knowledge sharing, advocacy, and action. The Center for Discovery and Innovation will drive a more prosperous, sustainable, globally oriented future for the island and enable Cape Breton University to take a lead role in providing innovative solutions to problems faced here in Cape Breton and in communities around the world. Janice has uh, quite rightly uh, highlighted some of the benefits of the Center for Discovery and Innovation. But in addition to that, we have been able to grow the footprint of the university from about 3,200 students to over 6,000 students. With the pandemic that has been cut back as most universities throughout Canada and the world have been cut back. But as a result of that, uh, we've hired uh, an additional 100 new hires at CBU. That's significant for any industry in Cape Breton. We provide in uh, provincial government taxes about 11.2 million. And the economic impact that the university has on the island is about $165 million. That is significant in anyone's books. We have provided assistance to a whole host of private sector entities in Cape Breton, some in Victoria County, such as Bedeck and Inganish, Lewisburg, uh, the Walmarts, the Tim Hortons, the Smart Shops, uh, restaurants, a whole host of uh, companies have benefited uh, from this influx of new students. That, my friends, is a substantial benefit to the island as a whole. But allow me, with your permission, to talk about probably the most serious issue that all of us face in Cape Breton, 
whether you are in downtown uh, Bedeck or whether you're from South Bar or wherever you're at in Cape Breton. And that's the population challenge. It is a big issue. And failure to address the population issue in Cape Breton is to invite, in my respectful submission, uh, serious and chronic economic circumstances. You will have more schools will close, public services will be reduced, poverty will be exhilarated, our taxes will increase dramatically for those that are still around. Some years ago, uh, the CBRM in Sydney commissioned uh, studies that show our population in the four counties of Cape Breton was on a serious downward spiral. Cape Breton, all the counties, each and every one of them had a decline. If you go back to the census in 1961 in Cape Breton County, to give an example, the, uh, the population uh, was well in excess of 100,000. The island now is 132,000. This is the first time since 1961 that the CBRM has dropped well below 100,000. So this population, what does it mean? Well, there's a book which was written by a gentleman from New Brunswick, a friend, Richard Salian. It's called A Tale of Two Countries. It talks about the gutting of the population in Atlantic Canada. A pretty serious book on the population decline. And the book talks about population growth from 1971 to 2014. And if you could throw that slide up, Steve, that would be helpful. Look at that. Over a 43 year period, the population growth in British Columbia was 107%, Alberta 147%, Ontario 74%, Quebec 33, PEI 29, and Nova Scotia, not the lowest in the country, but next to the lowest in the country. A very, very significant factor for us. So let's talk about Nova Scotia and population growth. There are 18 census divisions in Nova Scotia. From 2011 to 2016, when the last census was taken, three counties, just three counties out of the 18 had an increase or stabilized. Halifax, as you might expect, 3.3. Hans County, listen to this one, their population increased by 0.6%. And Kings County, over the same time frame, was zero, no increase. The rest of us, the 15 other census districts across Nova Scotia, all had a decline, and in some instances, a very significant decline. As a result of the book, the data, We've reached out as a university to people around the world to find out what they have done on population increase. And we didn't have to go very far. We ended up of all places in PEI. PEI over the last number of years have added to their population 13,500, the largest in the country per capita. The GDP in PEI is the largest GDP in the country. So in 2018, we had 3,200 students at CBU. 2019, we had 6,050. 2020, we had 5,000. Now, I raise these figures because it's important to understand what happened in PEI 
and what didn't happen in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. I went to PEI and I met with the Premier of the day and uh, Wade McLaughlin. And if you knew Wade, uh, he's the smartest man in the room and he doesn't mind telling you that. So I knew him from a previous movie. But what they did in PEI is that they focused on three buckets. One was international students. Two was attracting former PEI persons across the country back to PEI. And the third one was immigration. That's how they were growing their population. In Nova Scotia, we didn't do that. We did not do that. There is a shift now that is taking place in Nova Scotia, in New Brunswick, and in Newfoundland as they try to focus on those three buckets. Very significant in terms of growing the population in Cape Breton. So we at CBU, we took it seriously and we've grown our population. And this is the impact that Cape Breton University has made on the population in Cape Breton. Could you put that graph up please? You will see my friends that this is the first time in many, many years, well over 30 years, that there has been a population increase in Cape Breton Island directly attributable to the increase of the students at CBU. Now, don't take my word for it as a uh, president of a university, but Thomas Story, the director of economics and stats from the Nova Scotia Department of Finance said, and I quote, this was in the Chronicle Herald, March 2nd, 2020. The latest Statistics Canada numbers show that the university students had a significant impact, most notably in Cape Breton. There was an increase of 2,249 in net non-permanent residents in the CBRM. And just to put that into context, the increase in Halifax was 1481. So it's a very large jump. That's how much this means to the overall population in Cape Breton that's actually pushing up the population. Now, from where I sit and with my limited experience, I think there is probably six, seven, ten good reasons why the advantages of a Center for Discovery and Innovation can bring to Cape Breton. We have strategic advantages in Cape Breton that others don't have. Number one, we're a welcoming community. Without a welcoming community, do you honestly think that Victoria County would have picked up those two doctors? That's a significant factor for you, a significant factor for the residents there. But this is part of Cape Breton. We are a welcoming community. Number two, and we don't like to tell anybody this one because they may find out about it. We're the number one island in North America. My dear friend, the former governor of the state of Michigan, Jim Blanchard, good friend. He said to me, he said, you know, Dingwall, if we had that kind of information in Michigan, we would be spending millions upon millions of dollars to try to attract people to that area of Michigan. We don't do that in Nova Scotia, but that is a strategic advantage that we have. Number three, the pristine environment. You know about that in Victoria County. You're surrounded by that environment. And if you don't think kids today are not looking at our website and finding out about the pristine nature 
of Cape Breton, of the Bordeaux Lakes. That is a huge selling point. Number four, the product that we sell at CBU is a high quality education competitively priced. We are not the cheapest university in the Atlantic, we're the second cheapest. Mount St. Vincent are $87, I think, cheaper than we are. So we have a high quality product that is competitively priced. The other thing about Victoria County and all other counties in Cape Breton, which is the fifth strategic advantage, is a low crime rate. That's significant, my friends. Now, I have traveled the world in previous movies, but before the pandemic, I was traveling extensively to Vietnam, to Europe, to China, to India, to uh, <clears throat> Uh, various countries around the world. And in my submissions, after I had made them, there would become a lull in the conversation and the hands would go up. Mostly by mothers. I want to be fair here. And the hand would go up and they would say, Mr. Dingwall, some of them couldn't say Dingwall, they called me Dingaling or whatever it was, they would ask the following question. Will my daughter be safe at CBU? And it sort of shook me up when I first got that kind of a question. But what they were telling me is that where they live, it's not safe. And they're worried. You think kids today are worried about going to the United States? If they're brown, they're petrified. So we have a very low crime rate and a welcoming attitude. Number six is that in Victoria County and elsewhere in Cape Breton, we have an ability to develop lasting partnerships. At CBU, we have over 200 memorandums of understanding and articulation agreements. We have a 25 year arrangement with the Canadian Coast Guard College, the Nova Scotia Community College, dozens of nonprofit organizations, all throughout Cape Breton that the university has. We have that ability, ability to have lasting partnerships. Even on COVID itself, We've done pretty well. We're probably one of the safest areas in the Western world. Yes, granted we're down in a shutdown now, but relatively speaking, we're still very, very good as it relates to COVID-19. So my friends, uh, our collective task is to, is to help our citizens to understand the need and the positive impact that the Center for Discovery and Innovation can have on the university and on the community as a whole. Our vision at the university is bold, but it's strategic and it's impactful. So I want us to join with all of the counties in Cape Breton uh, to realize this vision, particularly on the population side, and to make our university and community stronger and much more viable as we enter this new world uh, as a result of the pandemic. So your support, a letter of support from Victoria Council would be very, very helpful to us as we move forward. We have the support of many other uh, municipal governments. We have the support of 12 uh, Aboriginal bands across uh, the province. We have the support of many private sector initiatives, uh, nonprofit organizations, all very supportive of this initiative because it means so much to the island and to the university in terms of our growth strategy. So your, your warden, I, I, I think I, I finished, uh, but I'd be happy to try to respond to questions if I can. Great, thank you very much for the presentation, Dave, it was excellent.
and I've seen it before. I know it's going to be very good. So I, I do want to open it up um, to council. And uh, I think uh, just because we are virtual, it's just easy to go through the district. So perhaps I'll start with uh, uh, Councillor Patterson's District 5. Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, President Dingwall, uh, congratulations are out to you, I think, because first of all, uh, you're making strides at the university. And also, I think the uh, other major thing you're doing is making connections with the community, uh, which, which is very important. Uh, like you indicated to uh, Mr. Parkinson, uh, if they want any assistance or whatever in uh, recruiting, uh, you may be able to offer some services and so on. So again, uh, congratulations on the work at the university and uh, hopefully this will become a reality. And uh, as we know, as you pointed out, I was surprised the figure in Halifax was so low as compared to, uh, to the students at CBU. So it, it is a major attraction uh, for them. Uh, just a question, do you have any idea uh, what the retention rate is? How many of those students actually stay in Cape Breton? Well, our, thank you very much for your, for your comments. Uh, on the retention, uh, the, the issue is uh, that uh, over 80% wish to remain in Cape Breton, which is quite significant. Uh, secondly, is that uh, jobs and opportunity for jobs is, is quite important. Therefore, succession planning for our small and medium-sized businesses becomes exceptionally important. You take, for instance, some of the tourism operators who are getting up there in years. They would love to be able to sell their business or to invite somebody in who could stay with the business for a period of time. And that's why we've had this uh, arrangement with our students. We take them from uh, the university to all parts of the island, uh, Victoria County being one of the biggest ones because of some of the great tourism uh, operations that you have there. Uh, thirdly is that uh, th there is a lot of interest uh, in the healthcare, uh, whether it be in the field of nursing and nursing assistants, uh, medicine, what have you. So it's, it's tied to that. And the more that we can do as a broad community of identifying some of these positions, uh, they will actually stay. What is particularly humbling for us is that we have a number of our students with the assistance of their parents who are investing in Cape Breton, whether it be restaurants, whether it be uh, clothing stores, whether it be uh, in the uh, automotive sector, that is taking place, which is very, very encouraging. That's the entrepreneurial type that I think we would all like to see in Cape Breton. So on the retention, it's not what we would want it to be, but because there is real interest, they want to stay and we're trying to assist them in finding those opportunities. Thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson. And uh, perhaps uh, we'll go to uh, Councillor Oregon. Any questions or comments for President Dingwell? Great presentation. It's it's good to see uh, our our little uh, place like uh, CBU uh, bring so many people in. I know uh, the Co-op Fisheries here in Neils Harbor has a lot of students working for the summer. It's good to see. And thanks again for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Deputy Warden Dauphin. Uh, yes, thank you, Warden. Um, thanks very much, uh, President Dingwall. Excellent presentation. Um, I'll be quite honest with you, I've seen the advertisement in the paper, I've heard the media uh, thing about the uh, uh, the project, and uh, you know, thinking that's great, great to see and stuff like that. But uh, after seeing the needs that you've uh, presented here today, um, definitely more on board than I ever was. Uh, you definitely are in need, and it's great to see uh, your remarks in regards to international students. Uh, being from the Inish area, we definitely uh, see the uh, orange and green uh, van shuttling uh, students back and forth to the Celtic and other uh, locations here, which is great. And really that's been a lifeline to a lot of the businesses here in Victoria County that are uh, really struggling with uh, staffing. So it's uh, 
uh, a great benefit for everybody, I think. And uh, I can give you my personal uh, commitment that I'm on board for this project now and uh, really looking forward to seeing it come into uh, uh, a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McDonald. Oh, yes, thank you, Warden. Uh, President Dingwall, excellent presentation. Um, like all the other councillors have stated, it's basically, it's uh, anything that's going to enhance Cape Breton, make our island better, sustain itself. I'm 100% on board, and I would uh, just love to see the progress as things take place. And just want to thank you again for the presentation. Good work, and please keep keep it up. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor McDonald. Councillor McNeil. Thank you, Warden, and uh, thank you, President Dingwall, uh, for your presentation, excellent presentation. Uh, as you stated, the project is definitely needed uh, with the diminished infrastructure and the uptake in student recruitment uh, from away. And I know, like you, uh, as pro uh, previous councillor stated, that the local inn and pub here benefited from international students from CBU. So I think we all know the importance of CBU to Cape Breton economy. I'm just wondering, uh, do you see the funding the provincial government put towards NSCC site uh, as a hindrance or a, a asset for the furtherment of the new project? No, I, I think it's all positive. Let me tell you why. Uh, the new facility on the waterfront in Sydney is going to be about 300,000 square feet. They're going to leave a building of 238,000 square feet to go to the new one. Uh, their programs, and I, and I say this with respect, so don't, don't misinterpret my words. Uh, they're experiencing a, a downturn in enrollment. Why? That's because of the population. But we have a memorandum of understanding with the Nova Scotia Community College. If I get this center, I'll be able to conclude agreements with them where we'll have kids coming to get their degree and they may be going to the Nova Scotia Community College for a year to become, whether it's a welder, a pipe fitter or whatever it is that is needed in the island. So I think there's great synergy between the two of us uh, as we try to build and fortify the human resource needs that are in Cape Breton. I mean, whether it is a nurse, whether it's a plumber, whether it's uh, someone in the automotive sector, someone working in municipal council, uh, whatever, uh, we can work together in terms of trying to eradicate those deficiencies that we have here on the island. So I think it's a good fit for both of us. We can help them and they can help us. And I'm quite excited. In fact, I'm hawkish about it in terms of, of, of what we can do in terms of, uh, of running the table as it relates. I'll give you one little example, if I may. One little example. The, uh, the demand for nurses worldwide is incredible. 87% of our graduates find employment in Cape Breton. So we'll be announcing fairly soon a new school of nursing at CBU. But if you were to invite international students who wish to be nurses, I mean, they could train in Victoria County because of placements. There's so many benefits that we could bring to the island as a whole if we can get this center. And with the center, you get top-notch facilities, top-notch uh, examining rooms, labs, exploratory rooms that will be very beneficial to the students who will be participating in them. So I see great opportunities here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McLeod. Uh, for your presentation, uh, now we can see how um, the, the building is in bad shape. Uh, it's, it's good to know that people know that. Um, it's a great uh, need that uh, people need uh, as students. Uh, it's a great action for Breton, uh, for young or to young professionals they want to study. And I will give you a thank you for having uh, you will is a welcome for inter intercultural lifestyle that we had before. 
as an immigrant I am, uh, is with see all these exchange students, um, people is more welcoming for, for our inter intercultural lifestyles. So thank you, Pat. Thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Councillor Longa, any questions or comments for the president? Um, hi, thanks a lot. That was an excellent presentation and that building is very impressive. Um, I, I actually know Janice, so it was really nice to hear her speak uh, today. And um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I'm doing my share in getting the population up because one of my sons just moved home with his girlfriend from Alberta. So they have two less and we have two more. And also when I go to Sydney, I've been to some of the great new food places that have all happened as a result of uh, you bringing in students um, to CBU. So thank you very much. And I support you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, just before we, we wrap up, uh, CAO uh, Leanne McCacken, do you have any questions for, for Dave? I know. Thanks for your presentation. Um, just to let you know that our uh, term uh, CFO is actually a CBU student as well, an, an international student, and we are more than pleased with uh, what we're getting from Amy. So um, we are, we're very much in agreement with this. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, and uh, th I, I too, as we wrap up, uh, President Dingwall, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. And certainly uh, we, will, uh, we will discuss the, uh, the letter of support this evening and we'll let you know how that goes. I, I, I think it's just critically important that uh, uh, everybody on the island realizes that uh, Cape Breton University is more, it, it has more of an impact than just being an educational and academic facility, just the financial impact, uh, the opportunity to, to uh, draw people from other countries and help grow our, our population. And the, uh, the impact it has is, uh, I think, understated in a lot of places. And I'm very pleased that you got that message out. Um, and uh, final word to you, and then we will uh, we'll let you go. Well, look, I, I want to thank you, uh, Warden, and, uh, and members of, of council and the CAO for giving me this opportunity to share some perspectives on, on CBU as well as on the Center for Discovery and Innovation. I do want to close uh, with one suggestion, if I may, which is I think all of us uh, need to join hands on this population increase. Uh, it, it's just so important for the island. If you don't have the people, you're not going to have the services. So uh, I, I'm working with the partnership. Uh, I want to work with uh, Victoria County and, and others as, as we look at the population increase. It's, it's significant and it's important. If some of us got to get our elbows up, well, so be it. Let's get the elbows up. But uh, the objective is just too important for the future of the island. We can't miss this opportunity on the population growth. We've got to hit it right square. And uh, I look forward to working uh, with you, Warden and, and Council and, uh, and other municipal units. Thank you so much. So, thank you. Just before you do go, uh, we had a presentation from President Nigmal. This evening, uh, he has asked for a letter of support for the Center of Innovation. Uh, we prepare to make a motion to provide that letter of support. Uh, so moved. That was moved by Deputy Warden Doffey. Do we have a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Longo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary minded. So there you go, President. We are fully supportive of your uh, Center of Innovation and uh, we look forward to, to continued uh, dialogue with you as you move forward with this project. Uh, thank you very much, Warden, and thank you, Council members. It's greatly appreciated. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Just going to go back to my agenda here this evening. We are going to move on to the next item of business. Uh, it is um, the minutes of our council meeting from May 3rd. Um, they have been circulated to you. 
you've had a chance to review them. Are there any errors or omissions in those minutes? Hearing none, uh, we have a motion to accept the minutes of May 3rd. I move. Moved by Councillor McLeod, seconded by. I second. Councillor McNeil, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded, motion's carried. The minutes have been approved. So we're just gonna look at those minutes for a minute and uh, if there's any old business arising. I'll turn it over to the CAO and then uh, if there's any questions or comments from council in regards to any business or old business, we will proceed. So please, Leanne, any updates you wish to provide? Yep, so I do have a few things to speak about. Uh, just to let you all know that uh, interviews for the Economic Development Officer through Cape Breton Partnership are happening this week and into next week. I'm sitting in on the panel for the hiring committee. So we will be doing some of those. And I actually think there's a couple of um, students from CBU who are um, putting their applications in. So we'll see how that goes. Um, you all should have received an invite for a TIR meeting that will be happening at the end of May. So that has been set up uh, with TIR. Um, in District 2, Perla, just to let you know that the solar light has, uh, has, uh, has arrived, is being assembled, and is expected to be installed tomorrow. So fingers crossed that will be happening. Um, Thank you. Also, uh, yeah, uh, it's a long time coming, but we're, it's here. Um, we have received a letter from Department of Environment on the trail development in Inganish, and we are moving forward with setting up a meeting. So there's a meeting set up in June, and Larry and I are attending that meeting related to protected areas. So I'm not sure if anybody else wants to be on that um, call, but if you do, let me know and we can get you signed up for that as well. Thank you very much for providing that information. Are there any questions or comments or any old business that uh, council wishes to bring up at this time? I had one just arising from old business, Leanne. If, uh, I know you've been in touch with uh, Irving and uh, their new representative at Oda meeting. Um, have you had any updates in regards to a virtual meeting with them? No, I have not. Uh, the representative that Irving has for government relations was in the process of moving from Ontario to New Brunswick. So I would expect that he is still in the moving process uh, at this time. So I will send another note off to him, but um, we are waiting for his invite for uh, a meeting. Thank you very much, Councillor McNeil. Yeah, just one thing. I, uh, I sent an email around uh, prior to council. I was in touch with MLA uh, Keith Bain on the weekend, and I brought up about the meeting with uh, TIR, and he was wondering about uh, getting a Zoom inv invitation to that meeting. So I just wanted to bring it up at council too. So thanks. Yep, we should be able to do that. And also, Paul, related to your area, or not exactly your area, but over uh, the lights on the, the bridge. Um, Steve at TIR has contact or has forwarded that on to the CBRM uh, district manager and who has also forwarded it on to some member in the department over there. So it's okay. being worked on, but I don't know how long it will take to get a light for you, but it is being worked on. Okay, thank you, Leanne. Just one other item out of bull business, the uh volunteer awards uh, for the most part have been distributed. They were distributed under uh, yes. COVID protocol. And uh, I want to uh, thank the counselors that did that. And I uh, just want to, again, thank the volunteers in our community for donating their time. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to do that and do it properly. So with that, if that's it for- Excuse me, Warden, can I ask yes. something for Leanne? Sure. Leanne, sure. I've, been get, I've been getting uh, calls again on fluorescent bulbs. Has there been anything I asked you to look into or are we just gonna do it on a special pickup or remember our, so, I asked you to look into yeah, it? Yeah, so yes, we are in the process of getting, um, well, we were before the third wave hit, but uh, we're in the process of trying to set up a hazardous household waste area at both of our locations or, or 
two of our three locations. So it's in the works, just not uh, up and running yet. Thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, so, question, Councillor. So hold on to them for now. Yeah. Uh, Thank if you. It's is it commercial or is it residential? It's residential. It's residential. Okay. okay. So yeah. yeah, if they're holding on to them, just hold on for another little bit to see if we can um, get this uh, hazardous household hazardous waste area set up. Okay. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, is that it for old business or business arising? That's all. That's all I have for old business. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on to new business and the CAO's report, please. Okay, great. Uh, so we had a department head meeting and another COVID check in meeting um, in the past week. Just to let you know. You're, you're breaking up on this, Leanne. That, okay, I'm going to turn my camera off. Thanks. A little better now? Yes. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, you all seem to be frozen on me, but uh, we'll see how this goes. Yeah, okay. you're frozen on us. Um, please, so we can hear you fine. For senior safety, the newsletter has been sent out. Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, so okay. the newsletter has been sent out. Um, the we're actually looking for. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Proceed, so, please. You can hear me fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so again, the newsletter has been sent out, but we're looking we're looking for a better way to get um, the newsletter out because it seems to be reaching all residents at this time. Uh, the funding related to the newsletter has also come to an end. So we're trying to find an initiative that uh, can update maybe a distribution list for anyone that might be looking for this senior safety newsletter. So it's an initiative that we're going to be working on. Um, something else that uh, is being worked on, which sounds kind of cool. Um, Cassandra is going to be hosting Coffee with a Cop which is a program that is starting at the first one will be May 26th at 10 a.m. on Zoom. And uh, we were, go we're going to have two members of the RCMP uh, sitting down with, uh, sitting down over Zoom with our senior safety officer. So again, that's May 26th at 10 a.m. Check our website for information on how to get onto that. Uh, she's also going to be attending a seniors housing conference. And she's working on sending in the final uh, grant report for the new Horizons project that funding has come to an end. Um, and what she said she's finding out as she's getting more comfortable in her role, she's finding that some seniors might need some life coaching. So uh, may not know where to go for, I don't know, if entering retirement or trying to figure out uh, stay in your home or leave or um, how to get out and meet new people, all kinds of different issues. So she's looking at different avenues and um, how to um, address these gaps and maneuver through them. So a few of the initiatives that she's working on. In the finance department, um, the PACE program is one that is going to need, uh, it's a bylaw that's going to need approval. So a copy of that has been sent out to you and we'll get to hopefully some readings of that in the very near future. Uh, she's also working on completing uh, year-end entries and getting ready for the audit, which will be happening uh, very soon. We had our final budget discussion earlier today where we're going to be coming up with some motions um, later on in the meeting related to rates and the budget. Um, just a note, I know that uh, we were supposed to have a tax collection strategy update earlier today. Uh, we changed around that due to some changes in the department, um, but we will be coming soon with a new tax collection strategy. Um, uh, it will be happening before council within the next month, I would be say, I, I'd say. Um, Amy's also looking at some different affordable housing initiatives. 
um, and reaching out to her contacts at New Dawn. We talked about that at a, la at a land um, meeting that we had last week also. In Lydia's department, recreation and active living, uh, Lydia has been working hard on placemaking and trails. Uh, she's been working on getting the Moby mats down to the park. So Larry, we might touch base on your other job um, to see about ways to get the Moby mats down to the park so that we can get them in the water. Uh, she's also working on a walk leader training course and working on Nova Scotia Active Smarter Kids program, which is a program to integrate into the classroom. She's working on an MPAL planning tool and working on updates on the website uh, in regards to funding and applications and finding more of a one-stop shop when uh, someone gets on our website in public works. So as you all know, heavy garbage is postponed until the fall. Um, that was a decision that was made that we are feeling um, very confident about the safety of our staff and the safety of residents is of utmost importance to us. And we want to be able to keep our operations up and running. And if God forbid somebody uh, got sick or spread COVID, um, we would have to look at closing down um, our location. So we're trying to keep them up and running. And so we're encouraging curbside collection and heavy garbage will be happening in, in the fall about the same time as it was last year. Also, um, during our COVID update call, everything over in public works seems to be currently in good shape. Uh, we do have some staff who are uh, concerned with uh, COVID. We are trying to practice as many um, uh, uh, safety protocols and COVID protocols that we can. And we are trying our hardest to keep our staff um, distanced and safe. Um, also to let you know, we will be, um, we did interviews related to replacing our recycling lead and uh, made an offer to an internal applicant. We are still looking at site locations for our wastewater treatment plant down in Inganesh. So that's being worked on. And we're also working on a request for quote for our, our courthouse um, overview of the issues and needs related to that building. So Robert over in Public Works is working on that, expecting that to go out hopefully by near the end of the week. I received a draft copy of it today. I still have to look at it. Also to let you know that um, there was a, an efficiency manager that has been hired through a group of nine, or sorry, six different municipalities, uh, six that we normally work with. Um, we have an efficiency manager who has been hired through Nova Scotia Power to do some efficiency audits. And we're looking for some easy wins and getting updated on some of the processes that we can save or that we can change to save some energy. So we're trying to figure out which ones of those are the most cost benefit for us. Um, no point in doing anything drastic at the courthouse right now when we don't know what the future of it is. So we're taking what they are, um, what they are recommending for us or ideas that they have. And we are um, looking through the, the time frame that the uh, cost for payoff would would be and seeing if it fits within the time frames that we're looking at right now. A couple of other things. Um, our washroom expression of interest is now up on our website and shared on Facebook. Uh, we had a meeting related to washrooms. This expression of interest is for the whole county. So any areas, this is kind of like a bonus washroom that uh, we are we have some funding for. So any organization, individual, uh, business, um, anyone throughout the county who thinks that this um, washroom could complement their organization are encouraged to apply. The information is on our website. Um, also, uh, just to let you know, we did a zero waste uh, project. We had funding from uh, Zero Waste Initiative. A group, a federal group. Um, we completed a project 
uh, and completed a report related to it. And we're going to be having Laurel Shanick, who did the work for us, come to council. Um, I think we'll set a meeting sometime next week whenever she is available to come and talk about her final report. She did four different initiatives and came up with some ideas related to uh, four different ways on reducing and reusing some of the garbage that we're creating. So uh, we'll be setting up a meeting related to that in the near future. Um, and then I just have on my report here a few different motions that we're going to need, but we can do that a little bit later on. So that's what I have. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And we will deal with those items later that you mentioned. So are there any questions or comments for the CAOC new business and her report? We're good. Um, we are scheduled to take a 10 minute recess at 620. It is 616. So we're going to take that recess now and we will reconvene at 626. Thank you. What time are we reconvening? <laughs> 626, Barb. Sorry, didn't make that out, Norman. 626. What time? Okay, thank you.
so at 626, we're going to reconvene council. Everybody can hear me? Good. The next item on our council agenda is the taxation update. I will refer that to Leanne, please. Yeah, so I want to give you a little update for where we're at for tax collection. So as of today, May 17th, our total outstanding is 737,000, uh, which is about 252,000 less than it was this time last year. So the makeup of that 737,000 is 336,000 in current and 400,000 in outstanding. So both of those areas are in better shape than they were last year. We still have a long way to go. Um, we are working on it um, and it is of utmost importance, but we are uh, heading in the right direction, which is great. Since our last uh, tax, uh, sorry, since our last council session, we have collected 45,000 um, in collection. Um, we have sent out a couple of uh, invites to bid on uh, title search, uh, short term title search um, uh, services. We have received back three bids from three different um, individuals or organizations. We are sending them some, a test title search, um, one that we already have done, but um, we want to send it to them to compare what we get back um, and see which one of them uh, sends us back as close to what we have received or more information and uh, we'll be using uh, these services for getting us to the next uh, tax sale. So our next tax sale is dated Ju July 20th. This is going to be a tender tax sale as well and we will be looking to have a public uh, auction tax sale as soon as the pandemic restrictions are lifted. Thank you very much. Any questions for the CAO in regards to taxation update this evening? Uh, yes, not taxation, but uh, the bills are going out soon? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so after we set the tax rate tonight um, or set the uh, do an approval of the rate, we then can go forward um, and start doing the tax bill, but we also have to have the rate from the village of Bedeck because those get printed on our bills. So as soon as we get something from the village, we can then go ahead and do the tax bill run. So I'm expecting um, early to mid June for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions for the uh, CAO in regards to taxation? Thank you. We're going to move on to uh, Department of Transportation Infrastructure Infrastructure Renewal, and um, we'll start with District Number Eight, please. Sorry, is Norman? Norman, are you? With, oh, there you are. Sorry. Yeah. No, sorry about that. Um, please proceed. Yes, thank you, Warden. Uh, just a few things this evening for uh, TIR. I had a call from a uh, resident in regard to a, a motor vehicle that it, that had burnt some time ago on the Capstick Road, just on the side of the Inverness line. And it appears that it's in the limits of the roadway there. And it's they're looking at, I guess, how, what is the process of having it removed as a responsibility of TIR. So I contacted Steve McDonald by email with regard to that. And he said that it was responsibility for the RCMP, which in turn, they don't know who the owner of the vehicle is. So, it's kind of dormant and it has been, I guess, there now since gone on two years. So I guess we just want to try to speed the process along and I'd be willing to use some of my uh, district budget if I could. So I want to have that vehicle removed there because it is an unsightly and it could be a, a, a danger to youth in that area there. So I'd like to put that on my list for TIR if, if uh, Mr. McDonald could get back to me on that. And uh, secondly, I'd like to thank TIR for a lot of the projects that have been done in District 8 of my list that was probably a mile long since last year. A lot of them have been checked off and I appreciate the work that's being done with the roads. Uh, I believe most of the roads have been graded within District 8. I'm just trying to figure out a, uh, a way that we can kidnap the grader to keep them <laughs> in District 8. <laughs> but I don't think that's gonna happen because I think they moved out. But I just like to thank them for the work they've done thus far. And um, 
lastly, once again, I was just the nice counselor, but I have to be the bad counselor here. It was just with the intersection of Dingwall Road. I had a call last week from a resident by the garage there in Cape North where the, the famous Y intersection comes in. This time of the year, it's the same all over the county, but the pink lines have all have all gone off the roadways there. And it, it's a dangerous spot. And it's just a matter of time for something bad is going to happen there. And I don't know if there's some directional signage temporarily they can put there. And it was, it was brought up that it will be um, considered when that area is to be repaved in futuristic years, was I believe the term that TIR used. But I'd like to have something if possible put there sooner than later. And that would be my uh, district concerns for TIR this evening. Thank you, Councillor. They're duly noted and captured in the minutes. District number seven. Uh, the only TIR I had was about the grader on the dirt roads in uh, Neal Tarver, New Haven, uh, in North Anganesh area. I'm not sure if it's been out here today, but I have not heard anything. So if we could just check on that, if it's going to be in this area. Thank you. I can do that. Thank you very much, Councillor. District number six. Yes, uh, thank you, Warden. The um, only thing with TIR is like uh, Councillor Organ mentioned is the gravel roads, getting a lot of calls on the gravel roads. I was in touch with uh, Steve McDonald last week and uh, he was under the impression that the grader would be in the uh, Neil Tarbur Inish area this week. So uh, since uh, Councillor McDonald wasn't able to kidnap them, I think we should expect it in our area shortly. So uh, that's it for this district. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. And uh, thank you, Councillor McDonald for releasing the grader. District number five. Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, continuing on the uh, theme of uh, graders and gravel roads, uh, the uh, road on the south side of Bullardry was graded sometime last week, I believe. And uh, MLA Bain and myself and Steve McDonald and I believe Joey Parker, who is the uh, local supervisor for DIR, we received an electronic thank you card. So that was kind of, uh, kind of made my day. Anyway, Good. that's it. Everything is fine, other than that. Thank you, sir. Good job. District number four. Thank you, Warden. Uh, yeah, I'd also like to thank Steve McDonald and his crews for all the work they're getting done. And uh, now that the roads are dry, the gravel roads are drying up and spring has sprung. And I hear that the grader's out down north and working its way this way. And that roads are getting repaired now that everything's uh, dried out and they can do the work, they are doing the work. So that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. District number two. Thank you, Warren. Um, just I want to put in the minutes. Uh, there, uh, uh, Steve knows about it. Uh, it's just uh, to so just put in the minutes. Uh, the sign in Western entrance on Beverly Hills is missing. Is reported um, the issue with the level on the road in Beverly Hills uh, is reported too. Uh, the lines, uh, it was an email about the lines painting, uh, the Cabot Trail and Middle River, the new section. Um, in Barb's district, the Kelly's Mountain, uh, my resident was uh, um, giving me his concerns and um, 500. Eight Zion Road uh, is reported. Uh, it's looking after now. It's just for the minutes. Uh, everything TR knows and MLA kids do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. District number one, Councillor McNeil, please. Thank you, Warden. I have a couple of items here. I was in contact with TIR about two holes at the gypsum outcrop in Jamesville. Uh, they were all they were on site today to assess the problems. They did fill one of the holes but it continues to settle and they'll be over again tomorrow and they are looking at a more permanent fix but it might take a while for that to occur. And also, I was in touch with uh, TIR about gravel uh, at the entrance of the John Neal George Road. I'm not sure when that'll happen, but I was in cover. Well, I emailed Steve about it. So that's the only two I had. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And just for District 3, I just want to uh, bring the attention of the department that when the uh, bush cutting equipment is in, that they would uh, take a look at some of the streets in the village itself 
particularly Alexander Drive, McLeod Street, and Herbie Drive. Um, and the, uh, the areas there, the shoulders, uh, there's a lot of grass and a lot of uh, small trees starting to grow along the uh, sides of the road and uh, they should be, uh, they, re they require some maintenance for that and some other streets, which we'll also outline and send to Steve. So thank you for that. That is our list for TIR. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor. Gordon. Yes. Um, I had one other TIR thing I uh, didn't mention was uh, that there were, were more inquiries about the street light at the uh, Bay Road exit to Bedeck. And I have contacted TIR again about that. And they said it, it had been reported to the electric contractor for TIR and it is scheduled on their schedule. And that uh, I guess Joey Parker is gonna follow it up by the end of the week to uh, make sure it's getting done. So thank you. Very good, thank you for adding that. Um, any other final TIR issues before we move on to the next item on the agenda? We are good, are there any no, um, notice of motions this evening? There are none, we'll go to district concerns and start with district number one, please. Yes, thank you again, Warden. Uh, being that 2021 is the 150th anniversary of the inception of Cape Breton Highlanders, uh, which or originated in Victoria County in 1871, I make a motion that a letter be sent to TIR to designate Route 223 as the Cape Breton Highlanders Memorial Way. Uh, my understanding is CBRM has sent their letter. Uh, so maybe, maybe you can get in touch with uh, them as a template uh, for a letter to be sent. And I was initially worried about uh, civic addresses being changed due to this, but uh, I'm assured that this is the way to go, that people won't have to uh, change their civic addresses. So if a letter could be written, it would be great. Absolutely, that is a motion from Councillor McNeil. Do we have a seconder for that, please? A second. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Uh, thank you, Councillor, and that's uh, an excellent idea to recognize. Anything else in District 1? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I had a couple of phone calls uh, this week about uh, the washroom and Bedeck not being open. And uh, I basically told them it's contingent on the Welcome Center being open. And uh, also, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we could look into a littering bylaw too. Uh, people were out cleaning up uh, along their own property and uh, through throughout the district and uh, while the, while one uh, while a couple of people were down the ditch I guess somebody drove by and threw something out into the ditch and I almost hit them so that's that's the way it, got, it is around here so something has to be done about littering in the, in the county thank you and uh, I'm just going to refer that for a second to the uh, CAO in regards to uh, potential bylaw and comment on that, please. Yeah, so we did have a bylaw uh, meeting um, last week related to different bylaws that uh, you possibly could be looking into. And that was one that Councillor McNeil brought up at that point also. So that is one that we will have staff working on. Yes. And I also just want to make a comment related to the washroom comment also. Uh, we, we also had a, a washroom um, meeting with uh, Babta, who run or who oversee and operate the uh, visitor center in the uh, Bedeck washroom. And we are looking to do a pilot project for this year about potentially opening it up for some extra hours. So we're working with Babta on that. So we should be seeing um, a few extra hours uh, on some other days that the visitor information center is not open as well. So that's an initiative that we're working on right now. Uh, but we'll come up with some more. Um, uh, when we figure out what the hours are, we will be posting that and getting that uh, word out to the public. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is that it for District 1? That's Sir? it. Thank you, Warden. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McNeil. Uh, District number two, Councilor McLeod. Thank you, Warden. Uh, just on some comments. Uh, I know June is next month, uh, is a proud month. 
So wonder if the staff uh, and council will be okay to raise the flag again. And if maybe staff have any ideas to do today, this, this year. Um, the other day, uh, last week, May 10 to the 16th was nursing week. Uh, last year, uh, the former council McGuinness uh, have an idea the, about Tim Hortons and in North with Robbins, Robbins about if we can uh, have a week the appreciation for the our health workers. I uh, wonder if we can do it again. I don't know. Perhaps CAO, do you recall what we did in that well, regard? Well, I think what we did last year related to, there was only, that's when the pandemic had first hit and there was only essential workers that were allowed to be out and on the road. So yeah. I think that we um, gave to Tim Hortons a- Yeah. Uh, uh, an amount yeah at, at both different locations uh, an amount for uh, coffee and I don't think that it was I, I think one of the issues with it was uh, Tim Hortons had to try and figure out who was healthcare related and it tied up their drive-through um, okay. so maybe maybe we can look at another way to do that yeah um, maybe just maybe a donation for in the hospital I don't know gift cards yeah. and yeah. to the hospitals and they can order the, you know, yeah. they're going to yeah. buy it. It yeah, might be, be something off up there, but we can have that conversation, uh, Perla. Okay, thank you. And uh, and the, um, today's International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. So I just put in the minutes the, today. And uh, and it's still the community cleanup. If I have I still have for my constituents in case they need more. Uh, right now we have to be in lockdown so it's easy to go to, for a walk and clean the garbage around. So that's it. Thank you, Councillor. And you. Uh, whatever recognition, I, I'm sure you meant to include this as well, whatever recognition we do south for health professionals that would be offered north as well. Just figure out uh, how we're gonna yeah, do to it. The both hospitals. Be, yeah. yeah, super. Thank you. Uh, district number four, Councillor Lomba. You're muted yeah. there. There we go. Um, yeah, I just have a problem on muting myself there. It doesn't usually happen. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I want to just say thank you to all the people that are out there cleaning up the ditches and they are doing it individually in, in their bubbles and it's been going great. And I'd also like to thank you to all the volunteers in all Victoria County and congratulations to those who did receive awards. And I didn't get to personally give any awards to any of the people that because COVID it was uh, lots of restrictions on, but uh, maybe next year. Uh, then I did have an inquiry um, regarding the bylaws. So uh, when there is a bylaw and it gets to the point that it's at the public reading, is there a place where public can access the bylaw to read it prior to uh, the meeting? Um, like, is it, is it put up somewhere online or somewhere where they can actually go and read it so that when they do get to the meeting, they, they've already, you know, read it and thought about it? Yep. Please check our website. Okay. So after our second reading, then it goes up on the website? Correct. Yep. Okay, great. And then I did receive a few complaints, uh, which I did uh, direct to the number on the website about the dump being closed and people concerned that people would start dumping uh, illegally. And that's the end of my concerns. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate those. Um, we're going to move on to uh, district number five, Councillor Patterson, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I got a couple of calls to the, earlier this afternoon from uh, two residents of uh, Black Rock and, and the situations I'll, I'll describe it to you, see what we can do. Uh, 
one of their neighbors moved out uh, of his house a while back and uh, in cleaning up and so on, he left the heavy garbage that he thought was going to be accepted in May or whatever uh, at the driveway. Uh, when they found out, the two neighbors that call me, that it's not going to be into the fall, uh, there's wondering, they're wondering if there's anything we can do. I mean, you know, there's a lot of he shouldn't have put it out. I know that, but he did. Uh, it's there. He's not there anymore. And the neighbors are suffering because of that to no fault of their own. Uh, so Leanne, maybe what I could do is send you an email and uh, we could talk to Robert and see if there's anything we could possibly do for that situation. Is there anyone in that property now, Fraser? Actually, someone from Ontario bought it and they're not allowed to come and uh, occupy it yet. Uh, I think I've already heard about this, but has the sale closed? Oh, okay. Maybe you did. Then. Okay. I'll, I'll send you an email tomorrow. Okay, great. So Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, more than interesting, you mentioned about the volunteers. Uh, again, I received uh, an email from the two volunteers uh, in Bulletry, John and Valerie Sobel, uh, and I forwarded it to Lydia. They were very grateful for it. And actually, he said, uh, John, when I called him, it's just a joke, you know, I mean, but they do all kinds of work around the uh, Catholic Church on the south side, so they deserve credit for that. Um, this could be an historic meeting for me. It may be my last meeting on the old uh, internet. We're supposed to get fiber up tomorrow. Uh, everyone will look better. I uh, did some phoning around just to inquire about people, how they uh, like the service. And uh, most of them are, are very pleased. Some are not so struck on the television part of it, but anyway, that's comes with the territory. But there was one particular gentleman I spoke to a year or so ago who runs a business out of his house. So I think he's doing web design. And he, you know, was having difficulties with the old, uh, the old uh, internet. So I called him this week and uh, I said, now, is it meeting expectations? You know, are you able to do what you want to do with it? He said, it's exceeding expectations, he said. So I think that's a real uh, benefit for, for us and, you know, all of rural Cape Breton. The people can actually come here now and have hopefully reliable internet that they can uh, depend on and they can make a living from their uh, own houses. Uh, so, success story, I think. Um, that's all on my list. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your report this evening. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, district number six. Deputy Warden, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Warden. Uh, just, just one issue. A uh, number of comments being made in regards to the dump being closed uh, to residential uh, customers. Um, a lot of people uh, either miss the, uh, the, the pickup day or they have some extra stuff around their home. Uh, they're just wondering if there can be a little bit of uh, consideration given to the uh, residential areas and open up the dumps. I'm not sure what the protocol is on that, but maybe Leanne and uh, Robert can get together and maybe take another look at it, see if there's any way, even if we could open up for a couple of days a week or something. Uh, there's very little, very little contact uh, with the uh, residents when they come in, but uh, if we could take another look at it, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. And that's it for District 6. So I just want to comment on that. Um, staff and I have lots of conversations related to this. We are in a pandemic. We are in the third wave. This wave is considered a social um, isolate, a social wave because that is how this has been spreading. Uh, at this point, we are encouraging curbside collection for all residential because we are not opening in the foreseeable future for um, for residential uh, drop-off. Um, what staff see happening at the transfer stations is that uh, people go in and it's treated as a social event. Um, and we are, it's, it's scaring our own staff. Um, it is po potentially putting them at risk. We have some staff already who are choosing to not come into work because of COVID concerns. And again, we don't want to put anyone at risk, uh, the public or our staff. So at this point, we are not, we're not looking to open it up and we're encouraging curbside collection. It may not be the answer you're looking for, but um, I encourage you to tell your residents, put it at the end of the driveway. 
No, that is reasonable. We uh, we understand that, Leanne. That's greatly appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Um, we're going to move on to uh, District Number Seven with uh, Councillor Oregon, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I got booted off there for a little while, so I'm I didn't hear what Larry's concerns were, but I was probably going to be the same one as as mine. Uh, getting called about the the dump and the depot reopening. So if 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 it's redundant, I'm I'm sorry. Um, but uh, if you could just uh, tell me again, sort of thing. And uh, I have, uh, like Pearl, I have uh, garbage bags and gloves still available for any community cleanup person. Um, greatly appreciated all that who have been out there doing it. It, it looks a lot better, but uh, there's still some places that uh, could use a little, little pickup. That's it for me, thanks. So Jackie, Thank you. I'll, no, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll just comment back, um, uh, reiterate what uh, Larry had mentioned because his concern was close to yours. At this point, we are encouraging curbside collection because we're not opening to residents in the near future because of this pandemic. Um, but here's, so, so that's it related to that. I just wanted to make one other comment. Um, here's the, what I love about having these sessions online and available. Um, there's 25 people that are watching right now and some are actually some of our staff. And I have a response, Jackie, to the fluorescent bulbs uh, comment. So we do have collection at our Dingwall and our Bedeck uh, sites for residential fluorescent bulbs. We do have to pay to get rid of them, but you can drop them off at, at those sites. So that came from a staff member that we have. Not, not, at, not at this time. Not at this time, <laughs> correct. Yes, so hold on to them. Yeah, exactly. But they can, when, when it does open up, uh, they will be able to take them in there. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you, Jackie. Um, District 8, Councillor McDonald. Yes, Warden, uh, just to... Once again, as the other councillors have stated, I think I've got my answers from the CAO there with regard to uh, the disappointment of postponement of heavy garbage, but to uh, reiterate that it's the safety of our, our staff and our residents, which is first and foremost. I did have a call uh, just prior to council from a gentleman who was uh, doing roadside cleanup. And he had asked in regard to um, the littering signs I don't know if there's any in any other districts in the rural parts. Is there littering signs present or is that just on 100 series highways? And his question was, it's, uh, it has a $250 minimum fine, but wondering who could we contact A, to get signs in place or if we even can get them in place and could we perhaps maybe approach the province and getting that fine increased because he had collected eight bags in the span of last week and he could go back and with another eight more this week. It's as quick as they're picking up, people are dumping. And that's not, this is everywhere, it's all over the county and it's been going on for too, far too long. So I think we should really try to, uh, you know, try to get a better handle on this somehow, right? Because I know garbage, whoever thought garbage would be such an interesting topic, but you know, it's uh, for tourism reasons alone, you know, it's just, it's unsightly and it's just disturbing to see what, you know, some people are doing. So uh, I kind of asked three or four questions there on that one thing. So in regard to the signs, is that something we would approach TIR with? That's a TIR sign, yes. So maybe I'll uh, reach out to uh, Steve, because I know I did that last year and he sent me a policy in regard saying that there had to be so many people in uh, a certain amount of area and it just, the policy was that long, I got tired of reading it to be honest with you. So didn't bother to pass it on to my constituents. Right. So, so currently it's a TIR issue, but um, as Councillor McNeil had requested that there be a littering bylaw put in place, right. um, I'm, I'm not sure if we can get more specific than the provincial one, but we will do our homework on it. So possibly we can have our own signs in the future. Yeah. And just to add on that, when they do the, the local groups here, when they're doing the community roadside cleanups, are they permitted to put, say, if it's 10 bags of garbage they have out with the regular waste now that the transfer station is not accessible? 
So what we were incur what we were planning on doing originally when we were planning our pickups, uh, we were saying that uh, bags could be left at certain locations and public works would pick them up. I'm sure that that still can happen and I can contact um, uh, public works department to find out if they're left um, in certain spots, uh, are they willing to pick them up, which I'm uh, sure that they would be. I just don't know where those spots would be at this point, so I can get you that information. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, they can be, if it is possible, it'd be better if they could leave them at the end of the driveway to, once again, promote safety with COVID and everything, instead of putting them in specific right. places yep. from traveling and about. I would appreciate that. It would be great. Okay. Uh, secondly, I had a uh, call from a lady this afternoon in regard to she did not receive her census and she was quite uh, she was quite upset about it you know she said other people have gotten their uh, census and she didn't realize why she didn't get it she actually lives down at the Capstick Manor there in Dingwall and there's seven or eight residents that are living in that facility and no one there got their census so I reached out and I was talking to the the gentleman who delivered the census and he said that he contacted his supervisor in regard and that it was uh something along the lines of a, a secondary format that the Census Canada does deal out. And he was told not to deliver to those people. So I was wondering if there's any way perhaps we could maybe clarify or reach out to Census Canada to get a better understanding. Uh, yeah, I can do my best. It, it's probably a computer generated voice that I'll get, but I'll, I can certainly uh, do some digging around and see what I can find out. Yeah, I would appreciate it. I honestly, I tried and I was 46 minutes in and I just had other things I had to do this afternoon. So I can give up on that. And uh, I believe that was, that's it for District 8 this evening, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, nothing really for District 3. I just want to comment very quickly on the, on the garbage issues that we've been discussing. And I I just want to remind council, those are legisl legislative protocols that are in place. And I understand people's frustrations. Unfortunately, these are the times that we're in and we have to follow the, the laws and the regulations. And uh, those protocols are in place to protect both the public and our staff. So, you know, in the meantime, as we are under that state of emergency or, or the protocols are in place, we're going to, to follow them. And uh, um, perhaps, uh, they'll be lifted uh, by the summertime, but uh, in the meantime, uh, we will be following the uh, recommendations of the uh, province and the uh, and Dr. Strain. And uh, I've heard comments both from council and from residents in my own district. So I understand, but it is what it is and that's the way it's gonna be. So um, moving on to our last items on council. Um, Warden. Yes. Sorry, before we move on, maybe we could go back to motions because there was a few that I spoke about that we didn't um, do yet. Yeah, those were the ones I'm gonna, those were the ones I was gonna get to here. I was just okay, sorry. getting my, uh, no, no problem. I was just getting my agenda. Up. Um, so with, uh, with what uh, Leanne had just mentioned, um, their the motions that we were looking forward or looking for tonight, we had, uh, uh, committee meetings earlier in, in regards to three items. They were the budget meeting that we had, the washroom meeting and the bylaw meeting. And we had those minutes were circulated to you. And um, we would like to have the motion to approve uh, those minutes. So could we have a motion to approve those minutes as received? I'll make that a motion. It's moved by Councillor McNeil, seconded by. Second. Councillor McLeod, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded, motion is carried. Those minutes have been approved. Was there uh, any other motions that you were looking for this evening? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so I just want to be sp specific that one of the motions was uh, a recommendation to raise the deed transfer tax from 1% to 1.5%. Correct. Um, there was another motion to approve the budget, leaving the rates at a dollar twenty-two residential and two twelve commercial. Correct. And uh, those items were in the budget meeting. Uh, Correct. Minutes. Yes. So yeah, right. but it's a good point. We should clarify that those are two critical 
items that we should uh, specify that were approved in the meeting. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, yeah, I know that no. the auditors need that as a yep. as yeah, and and also we probably need a motion to approve the budget as presented uh, as a whole. Yeah, I think um, yeah, that's a good idea. So I think we'll do actually we'll do two motions. Uh, one is to confirm our residential and commercial rates will remain the same. There is no increase. Uh, so we can have a motion to that, please. So moved. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Seconded by. Second. Councillor McLeod, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Motion is approved, and those uh, rates are approved. And the second motion was to approve the agenda, uh, the uh, budget as presented at the budget meeting this afternoon. We have a motion to approve that budget, please. I approve the budget as we was this afternoon. I second it then. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we have a seconder, please. I'll second that. Second by the Deputy Warden. So our budget for the operating year 2021-2022 has been approved as well. Um, thank you. Is there anything else, Leanne, that we yes. should pick up administratively? Go ahead. Yeah, please. I have one more motion. This is coming from Eastern District Planning Commission. Yes. Uh, so there was a revised appointment. So I received a letter May 11th from uh, John Bain said further to my correspondence of February 24th, 2020, must mean 2021, I would ask the council make the following appointments effective immediately in view of new staff and new staff qualifications. These appointments are in addition to the appointments which became effective <coughs> April 1st, 2020. So for building inspection, building inspector Amanda Estabrooks and alternates Andre Sampson, and also for alternate development officer Leanne Martin replacing Lewis Pope. So I will need a motion to approve those new appointments. We have a motion to approve those appointments, please. Make a motion. Moved by Councilor McLeod, seconded by. Second. Sorry, Councilor McNeil. Yep. All in favor? Contrary Thank minded. You. We have approved those motions or those appointments. Any other Sorry. motions come forward tonight? Sorry. That's that's all that I have. What about, we did make a motion on the D uh, transfer tax. That is correct. Thank you for that. We have a motion to, we are going to increase the uh, D transfer tax from $1 to a dollar and a half. No, from from 1.5, from 1% to 1.5%. One, sorry, 1.1% 1. 1 to 1.5%. 1 Am I correct? Right. Am I? Yes. yes, my apologies. We have a motion to that effect, please. Councillor McLeod moved it, seconded it. Second motion, yeah. Second it. Seconded by Councillor Longo. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Motion's carried. Is that it for motions, uh, Leanne? That is it, yes. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to uh, bylaws and we're now going to turn it over to uh, CAO. Okay, so we did have a bylaw meeting. Um, there's been several uh, copies of the bylaws that we are currently having in place. Um, wondering if we could have a first reading of the local improvement charge bylaw and a second reading of the community standards bylaw. And I'd also like to throw in the other PACE program if I could. So those three bylaws, two first readings, one second reading, correct? Correct, yes. So we just need a motion that we uh, have looked at those. Can I speak, yes. to, the, can I speak to, uh, the, we're gonna do them separately. We should do them separately, I think. We can do them separately. No. So can which I just one speak to you... the uh, land improvement uh, charges? Local, the local improvement? Local improvement charges. Yeah. Uh, most of you are aware of some of the concerns I had, but in, in digging a little further, and there's maybe two, two things I'd like to emphasize. Uh, I had mentioned the phrase user pay last time, and in Antigonish County, this is from their website, we have embraced the approach of user pay. So what it is, it's user pay. That's the first thing that I'm concerned about because that goes with, and I think Leanne, you said it last time, either the users pay or the whole county pays. So that goes to your philosophy of government. What do you think government should do for its residents? Um, so the other so thing, 
that is in most of them that they cover uh, water, sewer, sidewalk or pavement uh, improvements. But Annie Ganesh supposedly has municipal services such as road improvements, water and sewer, fire protection, and street lights. So we would end up having users pay if, if now it's not in ours right now, I know that, but still that's what's in others. Um, the may to shall, I think that's a big, it's only two small words, but it makes a ton of difference. The only thing it wasn't changed in the, in the version I got today in section two under a procedure. So if you change the shall to may, it makes a big difference. We, we did um, change that. We made that change. It's not, it's not in the text of the uh, draft that was sent to us today. It's not changed, it's still shall. And finally, um, maybe we could explore, and I think uh, someone else has mentioned this too, especially with our seniors, if there could be income exemptions to these, if these charges go through. Uh, for example, uh, if you were getting housing grants, you provide your T4 slips, and if you're below a certain income, you qualify for the grant. Well, in this case, if you were below a certain income, you wouldn't have to pay the, uh, the charges, the extra charges. So those are just some things to think about. Uh, and keeping that in mind, what I just said, I, I can't support this going forward in its present state. So just let everyone know. Thank you, Warden. Thank you. Um, Leanne, do you oh. want to comment on those comments, please? Yeah, so uh, Fraser, I'm not sure. Are you in favor of a user pay or not in favor of a user pay? You're muted. You're muted. That's the whole question that we haven't grappled with. Are we in favor of user pay or not? So uh, in our so health system, for example, the federal health system, people have fought for decades to not have user pay. So we just had this meeting at a at the bylaw meeting last week, mm -hmm. and we discussed this where we were going to go forward with the first reading of this, where everyone yep, was in agreement. Right. And I came up with this Anaganish website just since then. So, <laughs> So everybody was agreeing. I, my my understanding, everybody was, was agreeing in the meeting. There was a first reading. Yeah, we take it forward to first reading. That's all I agreed to. That doesn't mean I agree with the bylaw. So you're in, as far as procedural. Yeah, exactly. Process. Yeah, yeah well, it has to get that far before you can agree or disagree to it. <laughs> so, okay. So you wanted to move this one to the bylaws meeting, which we did, and you agreed at the bylaws meeting, and now you are in disagreement? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Now you are not in agreement? I was in agreement of bringing it forward to first reading. But I'm no, not. No, this in was the first the reading. There's two different this things. Was to we, can't, be the first we can't have anything happen until it comes to first reading okay so are you in favor of all residents having to pay for something specific to a certain location i you lean think? that way yes okay but there are there are things that i that i just mentioned income exemptions for example and other things that may be changed in it which i could probably accept So uh, what are our wishes here? Are we, do you, have you had a chance to, I, I know that you looked at these and you were bringing in um, some suggestions. Uh, we are going to go to a second reading. Do you feel that the changes that you were suggesting could be incorporated in the second reading? Thank you, Warden. Well, that's what we're here for tonight, to discuss this. Everyone has their opinion and we come to a conclusion. And if I still disagree, I still disagree. Seven people can pass it. And if seven people pass it and I disagree, I, that's the decision of council. I go along with it. 
That's, That's democracy. Yep. Yeah. So what I'm suggesting to you, if we uh, just because it's a reading doesn't mean it goes into effect. Reading is a, is an editing of uh, of the bylaw. So I guess what I'm asking is, um, do we wish to incorporate some of the changes that you are identifying tonight? in the second reading. Yeah, and I apologize because I thought that the last version that was sent out or the two last versions that were sent today had the shall and may change in it because that is one that I do agree with. So that is a word that uh, I was expecting to have been changed in that last copy. So somehow- So just- yeah. Warden, I think, sorry, sorry. Warden, I think what, what, what you said is absolutely true. If uh, you put it to a vote tonight, if it passes first reading, then at second reading, amendments could still be made to it. That's right. why you have the second reading, exactly. right? Yeah. And then the yeah. public hearings come along. The public may say, look, we love this or we don't like it. And then amendments could be made at that point too. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it is, it's just because you approved the first reading doesn't mean it's the final version exactly. of the bylaw. Yeah. No, I'm with you and I understand what you're saying. And, and Sorry, go ahead, Councillor McNeil. Sorry about that, Warden. And that being said, like, would we have another bylaw meeting uh, in between first and second readings to discuss what what should be uh, well, what's talked about tonight? Well, I, I'm not sure if we'd need a meeting, but uh, maybe what what we can do is that uh, Councillor Patterson can uh, forward those uh, issues that he brought forward this evening, uh, send them to the CAO, and she look at those incorporate some of those changes we'll have a look at it at the second reading and if it's uh looks okay and everybody's in agreement fine if it's not then we will have to have that discussion then but i wouldn't necessarily say we would uh, require a meeting mm, okay. at this point sir councillor long but um I, I just like to like understand more what fraser is saying because i don't really understand what he what what it all means you know as far as what it's saying now and saying user pay like i don't really understand uh what that means for everybody yeah uh okay and so rather than to get so I, uh, that could be explained yeah and i and i think rather than try to try to get uh, clarification for everybody tonight. I think if uh, we ask Councillor Patterson to send his uh, recommendations slash suggestions to CAO and then they'll be reflected in the in in the copy that she sends out. And I think you'll see what uh, what the differences are. We'll show you the before and the after so you'll see what the what the changes are. Now those are proposed changes, not permanent changes, but they'll be there. And if there's any further um, clarification re required, we will have that discussion at the second reading of that document. Does that sound reasonable to everybody? So with that, we can still, uh, we still be require a motion for the first reading tonight. Just keep in mind, that's not going to be the final document. We are just making a motion to get the bylaw up and running and this will be a motion to approve the first reading. I make a motion for the first reading. Okay, we have the, and we're gonna do three separate motions for the three bylaws. So that is been moved by Councillor McLeod. Do we have a seconder, please? I second. Second. Councillor McNeil. Sorry, I heard Councillor McNeil first. So all in favor? Any contrary minded? Nay. Duly noted that uh, Councillor Patterson is not in favor. All right, uh, the uh, first reading has been approved by um, seven of eight and uh, we will take a second look at second reading and incorporate those changes. The other two bylaws, Leanne, one was the PACE yeah, the PACE program, uh, which is the program to um, put in place the administration so that we could lend uh, to residents um, and add onto their tax bills. 
for any energy efficiency upgrades that they're planning on doing, and we have to have a bylaw for it. And that bylaw has been forwarded out to everyone. Do we have a, a motion to for the first approved first reading of the base bylaw? Uh, so moved. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Do we have a seconder, please? Second. Second by Council McLeod. All in favor? Aye. Right. Contrary minded. Motions carried. And the third bylaw, Leanne? Yeah, the third bylaw is the community standards bylaw. Uh, so there were some councillors who were concerned with noise and uh, graffiti and uh, what's the other one that we had specifically put in there? Um, uh, it was noise and graffiti. So we came up with a community standards bylaw related to that. Uh, we've had, uh, it's, it looks a little different now than the first time that it went out, but we have had first reading of that, had a bit of a change in the format of it. And so we're looking for a second reading of that one. We have a motion to uh, approve the first reading of that bylaw, please. Second reading. I'm sorry, second reading. Move. Moved by Councillor McLeod, seconded by. A second. Deputy Warden, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded? Motion's carried. Bylaw is approved, second reading. All right. Uh, any other, that's it for bylaws, I believe, CAO? That is it, yes. Uh, any correspondence come to Council tonight? Uh, nothing extra that I have. Everything I have, I've forwarded on to council. Um, the only correspondence I received, and I don't have it in front of me, but was there a proclamation for age friendly or it's not sort of senior safe? Oh, uh, uh, yes, it was for a, a World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, uh, which will be happening in June. And uh, do you? You by chance have that proclamation, the wording there by chance? I, I mean, don't. I'm sorry. No, we can, no, no problem. We we have another meeting in June third. Right. Yes. So yes. we'll we'll take that proclamation forward in June, and it is for a date in June. So, okay. was there any any other okay. correspondence? We did. We had one from a Catherine Hart at Engage Nova Scotia, yes. uh, who was looking to come to. Council today, um, if we had a spot available for her, however, um, we were filled up. Um, she is uh, inviting everyone to a Nova Scotia Quality of Life Initiative regional gathering for Strait Area Western Cape Breton on June 3rd from 6 until 7.30. Uh, it's co-hosted by Engage Nova Scotia and the Strait Area Western Cape Breton local leadership team and it's part of the regional efforts of the Nova Scotia Quality of Life Initiative. So I believe that the warden has sent out information related to um, this. So they are encouraging everyone to sign up if you would like to. And the information I sent out was a copy of the email that we received and there is an attached uh, letter of invitation, which uh, hopefully you've received. Right, and they will also be sending out um, individual emails to council members in the coming week. And that's for your information. If you decide to sit in on that session, I'm sure it'll be uh, interesting. If you're available, are we attend. in council meeting that night? Yeah. You... June 3rd, we just said we're having a meeting yeah. on June 3rd, and then... <laughs> just a second. You are, you are very correct on that. So anyway, we'll let them know that it is... Uh, we could... Depending on if uh, people feel strongly, we can move council no. to the fourth. No, so June or sorry, council session is May thirty first. June third is a Thursday. Okay, I don't know why I thought that, but that gives us three council meetings in May, probably one in June. All right, thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure who's uh, manning the virtual as the technical side of. Uh, the meeting tonight, are there any, whether it's Dan or Garrett, does anybody have any questions from the public this evening? There are no questions at this point from the public. Um, I do have two comments though, that were on from the public. Uh, one was from a Carmela Ann Murphy said, a big thank you to Jackie and Larry for getting the Murphy Road sign replaced. 
Um, and there is another comment on here from Keith Bain says, hi again, everyone. In response to Norm's question about littering signs, I will contact Steve as well to see what the policy is. I know that presently there are some secondary roads. Also in response to Councillor Longo's comments about the intersection light, I will also contact Bernie Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Bain. Uh, any final comments before we end uh, tonight's session? Thank you very much for attending and thank anybody that has joined us virtually tonight. We appreciate their interest in County Council. We are uh, next meeting is May 31st and uh, we'll see you then. I move we Good adjourn. Night. Thank you for the motion to adjourn. All in favor? Contrary minded. See ya. Good night.